Recently, I got to hear an amazing group of musicians at the Side Door Jazz Club in Old Lyme, Connecticut, and was fortunate enough to get some incredible interview footage with them as well. The group is the Michael Dunn Quartet, featuring Michael Dunn on organ, Eric Alexander on saxophone, Paul Ballenbeck on guitar, and Joe Farnsworth on the drums. Each of these musicians is among the elite, the top shelf, as good as it gets. And besides offering us incredible musicianship, they have a wealth of knowledge to share when it comes to improvising and playing music. Eric Alexander has just released his second Better Sax Course 22 Minor Key Explorations. It's the follow-up to 21 Major Key Explorations, and I can highly recommend both of these to any student of jazz improvisation and not just saxophone players. I put a link in the description if you'd like to learn more about those. Eric has recently picked back up the alto saxophone and has been recording and performing on that regularly. Here you can hear him playing the better sax burning alto mouthpiece and I put a link in the description where you can learn more about that or order one for yourself. Put your hands together! <laughs> You know, that's uh, that's what I like to do. I like to get right on the edge and uh, almost like you either do or die. Like any, any second, one little slip, you can go down hard and completely fail. But uh, you ride that edge and right there is where the spark is, you know? And you can get at some stuff that you never even thought you could do, you know? And people say, well, you know, what's the big deal? You're just playing fast. But you gotta think fast. And you got to be able to have the technique to play fast. So there's something to be said for that, you know. And then it's all happening spontaneously because you've ever practiced these things. It's not made. It's made up on the spot. So uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy that stuff. I enjoy playing slow and medium. But uh, but fast is um, fast is a challenge. But the thing is, well, I came up as a young man growing uh, growing with uh, people much better than me, like Milt Jackson. And, I played with Sonny Rollins and Benny Golson and Art Farmer. And uh, I find that uh, the caliber, they pull you up, you know, they pull you up to their caliber and that's how it works, you know, and you just, you just rise to the occasion. learned how to play. I mean, the, you know, I had a little bit of, uh, of, of school, but basically, I think by the time I was 21, I was out playing with people. And, you know, one of the, the, the worst feelings in the world is you're playing, you're in your own world, getting off, doing your thing, and you look over and everybody's looking at you. And you're like, uh-oh, what did I do? And then you realize somebody's going to come and say, hey, man, you need to pay attention. You need to listen to what's going on. So you hear that a, like a couple of times. That's really all you need. And then that becomes your primary focus. And, you know, being able to hear what's happening, you know, you work on your ears. And just by doing it for many, many years, over and over and over again, you start to develop a sense of like, oh, that's this chord. This is another chord. Oh, that's that harmony. Okay, it feels like the time is going this way or it's going this way. And you can kind of make these adjustments without really thinking about it too much. And at the end, you just play. You just play music. You have to play. You, know, you can't, you know, you can't overdo it. Like here, this is all my greatest stuff. But at the same time, you can't be shy about it. You know, you have to kind of just put it out there. And, and, and if you're listening, you won't put a foot wrong. Put 
put some things down that were fundamentally correct. Uh, people don't want to hear that, but this is a truth that should be acknowledged. Some things sound good, other things do not. I didn't make them up. I'm just a vessel. I'm not telling people this is something I made up and you must, you shall do this or you can't play. No, I'm just offering uh, to the best of my ability a representation of what I have learned from people like George Coleman and from other masters and to make it simple because quite frankly, just like quantum physics, simple math, simple constructions that resonate are the best. So as you know, Jay, what we did is just put stuff together that is not rocket science. It just sounds good. And anybody that can grab it and pocket it and expand on it will have a lot of information. That's the whole point. This is what a person must do. Uh, for lack of a better term, I call it ass time. You know what to do. You can pass a theory test, but have you sat down on your ass and run the shit through the keys? Pardon my French. Excuse me, it's not French. Have you sat down and done the grunt work? It's not that hard to understand. It's hard to do because people want to insert their little trivial trivialities and their free will into stuff. And they want to say, well, I don't like that. I'll do something else. Man, wrong. As George Coleman says, there are some things that are right and some things that are not. And the best thing to do is start with things that are right. You can't break the rules if you don't know what the rules are, can you? I can't play outside a tonality if I don't know how to play inside a tonality. It's impossible. You can't have one with, without the other. Just take what is good, learn how to do it, then break the rules later, but not yet. I can't even put into words what a joy is, it is to play with these excellent musicians. There is absolutely no arrogance or competition or anything. Each of us wants the others to play the best they can. They don't care if I screw up, nor do I care if they screw up. And I screwed up a lot tonight, and I did but they don't care and that fundamentally that makes me comfortable i can try things i can try to play a song on alto saxophone that i've never played on alto saxophone in my life and maybe screw it up or maybe not but to be in that comfort zone where we're where we're trying without competition well no it's actually we're competing but it's competition without animosity and actually that's what it is mike ladon is kicking my ass but because he is not because he wants to hurt me if he plays better than me on a tune i say well i don't get mad get even get better i like to be around people that play better than me like yesterday with george coleman he overran me with some harmony good I've been thinking about it all day. I couldn't learn that stuff and process it if he wouldn't do that. And he doesn't do it out of malice. He does it out of love. That's another thing people don't understand. A musician should never feel sheepish about playing their best and overrunning somebody because you're worried that they will resent it. If they resent it, that's on them because it's out of love. And it's all about music is bigger than us. We should always do our best. And if someone's better than me today, well, I'll try to get better. And if I can never be as good as them, who cares? Don't care. The only thing I can do is be the best Eric. That's, that's it. Fundamentally, I would never even play alto if it weren't for your mouthpiece. And in fact, I never played it for 30 years, nor has George Coleman. And we spent the entirety of yesterday evening playing alto in his apartment, and he's never done that. So what does that mean? Well, perhaps nothing, but I think it means something. That mouthpiece that you've crafted with the help of Jody Espina is a miracle because a person like me that thought he would never play alto in his life now feels so emboldened that I'll play a student horn, make mistakes, suck, and enjoy it because I enjoy the sound that's coming out. And it, that's so important if you're not getting a sound that's comfortable and a pitch uh, frame of reference that makes you feel at least adequate. There's no way to go from tenor to alto. Because alto is kind of a litmus test, so I, I think what you've done is spectacular, but people don't have to take my word for it. Ask George Coleman. <laughs> I mean.
That's yeah. a great sound on that day with that mouthpiece, man. Yeah. That's, that, that's a hell of a mouthpiece, man. George told me it's the best after mouthpiece he ever played. And he means it. He would never lie. He would never be hyperbolic with a compliment. If he said that, he means it. Well, you have a great musical. I wish you had sat in tonight, Jay, because you're a great player. You have a, uh, a musical aesthetic. We need people like you because, well, obviously you do because you're able to come up with something that is so appealing. You know, with George Coleman, if you didn't know what sounds good, you wouldn't have been able to come up with it. And uh, I trust you actually implicitly. After you sent me the five, then you sent me the six and the seven, and you said, well, try them, Eric. Don't, uh, don't be set in your ways. I ended up liking the seven. You were right. This group is great because everyone is self-reliant. Nobody needs to be babysat. And the organist, Mike Laton, well, as you saw tonight, Jay, he often just starts playing things. We don't even know what he's playing. And if you have people that need to be babysat uh, or their hands held, they wouldn't be able to survive. But Paul Ballenbeck, I mean, he can play, he can hear everything and he can play anything that he hears. And Joe Farnsworth, well, he's a drummer, it doesn't really count. But you can play anything, and he gives everybody what they want. That's like Billy Higgins. He plays for you, not with you. That's an important thing. I like to believe I can hold my own. Even if I don't know what's going on, I'll fake it well enough. I'm an actor after all, and we are. But this this band is just so fun to play with because it's no holds barred, launch, go for it, and no hard feelings. You know, if somebody wipes out, Somebody did something that was a little too hip for the other people and nobody gets upset. It's great. I used to really um, avoid jam sessions because when I would go to a jam session, my feeling was that everybody was trying to prove who was the toughest player rather than trying to improve. And there's a big difference. Young musicians should find associates with whom they could sit in a room and play a blues for four hours straight and try everything they know without being ridiculed. That's how you improve. You don't improve by working on one tune and going to a jam session, calling it, and playing your best licks. It doesn't work. McCoy Tyner told me he's the only person that could refer to John Coltrane as John. He said, John is my greatest teacher. And I said, why, Mr. Tyner? He said, because he wanted me to play until I had nothing left to play every night on every tune. Until I had nothing left to play and he had no ego about it. If I outplayed him, he did not care. He wanted me to find everything. And that's what we should do when we're practicing. Go after things without concern of making a mistake. How can we know if it's good or bad unless we screw it up? You can't. You can't stop when you mess up. The key is to mess up and continue. Sometimes you have cats on the band stand and cats in the room. You're playing for the... Harold Mayburn used to say, what is wrong with you? You're playing for the cats? Stop it. Nobody cares what the cats think. You have to play for the people. If you don't know what to play, don't play. That makes the musicians happy. They get to fill in, play when you know what to play. And if you don't have anything to play, don't play. It's just stop. When we play nonsense, we know we're playing nonsense as we do it. And we get, uh, get self-conscious and then we try to cover it with more nonsense. And it's just terrible avalanche of negativity. It's very important to be focused and play things that sound good, that you hear in the moment, or that there's no crime in this, that you know will sound good. If you know something will sound good, you still have to place it, which means that you have to be present and you have to feel the rhythm. So that's not a lick. I'm tired of hearing that. If you have a four bar phrase that you know will sound good, you still have to be in the moment and present and, and put it there. That's impro improvisation, actually. Because right before you're ready to place it, somebody might do something that throws you off. So you're improvising. Can you get connected to the game before and what's going to come up? Yes, that's why there's very little difference. And Chick Corea made this point between uh, uh, Glenn Gould and Charlie Parker. They knew what they were going to play before they played it. Now, everybody out there in uh, radio, TV land, don't get offended. It doesn't mean Charlie Parker worked out his solos. He knew his harmonic template. 
before I played it. And if you hear something, that means you know what you're going to play before you play it. Glenn Gould playing Bach, he is Bach. He plays as if he is Bach. He's improvising. If you don't think that way, you can't play Bach. Thanks so much for watching. Now go ahead and watch this amazing interview next.